You can build a manipulation machine if you have enough data. Foreign agents, foreign actors, or domestic criminals can pay for the opportunity to run executable JavaScript type of software on US government machines. It's become evident that something sinister is happening. On many popular uh, websites, there is over a hundred data grabbing trackers hoovering up your information and providing them to third parties. Failure within the industry is going to result in a panicked need to make an urgent transition that should have been a gradual, mature, smooth one. And that's quite a terrifying prospect. The early days of the internet had huge promise. There was a chance to democratize information, there's a chance to sell from anywhere, um, there's new business models emerging, um, and it was a really, really exciting time. One of the key things that, that when you talk to people from that, 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 that time, the, the Tim Berners-Lees, the, the Jaron Laniers, the Brendan Ikes, um, th there was a chance that some of the things that we got wrong, and many of the things that we got wrong in the world of bricks and mortar, we got to rebuild them better in this new digital world. The breakthrough moment was the advent of Netscape. For the first time, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of people could get online. It was a lot more basic than what we know now, but it was really revolutionary at the time. Even though it was dial-up, people were getting a chance to interact with people from around the globe, swap emails, share a whole lot of different experiences. Um, and that, and that, was, that was a really heady time. So we had all those dreams, but that's not how it turned out. The early vision of an open internet where all the players got to contribute and got to benefit equally, that's gone. Over the last 15 years in particular, there's been an increasing centralization um, of, of all of the activity on the web. Um, and all you've got to think, all we as individuals have to think about, is where we spend our time. It increasingly goes to a small number of walled gardens, the places where we search, the places where we uh, send messages to our family or, or colleagues at work, the places where we go for email, and the places where we buy. Um, th this has become a very sterile environment where only a small number of players have a huge amount of control. Let me take you back to 1994, to the first banner ad that was run on Hot Wired, um, which was the online version of Wired. It was for AT&T, and that humble banner ad got a whopping 44% click-through rate. And if you compare that to today, where, where display advertising gets well less than 1%, it was a huge success. And behind that success, it pioneered a template um, for, for publishers like Wired and Hotwired to provide free services to users paid for by advertisers. And this was the beginning of the, the free web. So here was a new template for publishers that wanted to create content online. And it gave the promise of uh, content for users, and it was paid for by advertisers on the other side. So publishers now had a business model and this moved from being something for hobbyists who did stuff largely for, you know, for free and out of enthusiasm to a, a business model that would enable publishers to scale online. From that humble ad, a huge industry grew. And this, this massive ad tech industry. And, and as that I I evolved, people became banner blind. The, the ads that you saw had less and less impact. So there was a need to evolve. Um, and the thing about the internet, it's different to traditional media. You're able to gather personal information, which you couldn't do with a newspaper. And that ability to collect and extract information from people as they travel across the web became really valuable. The more data you have about somebody, the more you can determine what decisions they're going to make, the more you can understand what their preferences are, the more you can subtly nudge people in a particular direction. Ultimately, you can build a manipulation machine if you have enough data. You can build a machine that can, you know, seriously influence people at key points. That might be somebody looking to buy a car, that might be somebody looking to vote in an election, that might be somebody looking to do any of a number of different things. But when you build an apparatus like this, you can do phenomenal things. That industry is now worth $330 billion. People ask, <clears throat> what value has data? Just look at the, 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 the share price and look at the market capitalizations of those big tech companies. That tells you all you need to know. 
for a long time, the public didn't really notice what was going on. They didn't pay attention. They weren't aware that this uh, data collection system was going on in the background. But there's been a gradual awakening. We don't, as individuals, always know the detail, but it's become evident that something sinister is happening. When, when creepy ads follow you across the web, when things happen that you go, that's a, that that's, that's implies a lot of knowledge of my personal habits and the things that I've done, we kind of subconsciously know that something is happening. Um, but, but that awakening is really starting to bubble up. People think they're just uh, surfing the web, uh, downloading web pages, but what they're really doing is downloading the surveillance economy. As you transition from page to page, you're not just downloading what you're seeing on the front of that page, you're also downloading a whole lot of trackers and, and, and things that are designed to profile and, and gather your data. Um, on many popular uh, websites, there is over 100 data grabbing trackers hoovering up your information and providing them to third parties. So people say, so what? They're just collecting a bit of my data. But when you take a step back and you understand that if you collect data about groups of people or, or countries, that gives the owner of that data real power. We've seen this with Cambridge Analytica, and it, it gives the, the owner of that data the ability to nudge, influence, and manipulate large groups of people. You visit a website today, and you will see buttons where you can click like or retweet. Now, the social networks that those buttons represent clearly receive those data. That's obvious to you. What may not be obvious to you is that the companies that provided that widget, who are in between, they are also receiving those data and probably selling them on. That's one way that these data um, about you leak out of web pages. Another is in the ad serving. So we have this descending spiral, this fight for attention and the fight for data, where uh, essentially profile data about you are used to target ads to you. And that might sound benign because websites need to show ads, right? But the question is what happens to the data exhaust? Right? What happens to these data that are clearly showing what sites you're on and where you are and what type of person you are when you're on those sites? And the answer is nobody knows. So what happens to my data? When I am next submitting my CV online and some you know, hidden algorithm decides whether to shortlist my CV for the job. Does that algorithm have access to data about me that at some point was hoovered up about me without my knowledge? When I next buy an airline seat, is my seat cheaper or more expensive than yours? And what were the criteria that decided that? And was that decision fed by information that someone snooped out of my web behavior. And the same question is in my mind about applying for a mortgage, about applying for insurance, health insurance. The same question is very, very present in my mind as we head into the next election. What data about me is floating out in this data broker ecosystem without a chaperone, without my control? The fact that I can even ask that question shows that we are living through a time that historians will probably call the great civilizational data breach. Where do those data come from? Well, many, many, many possible places. From the 2000s on, with the evolution of online tracking, we end up with a, with a situation where just from one part of the online advertising industry, you have hundreds of billions hundreds of billions of pieces of information about individual people being broadcast out to thousands of companies, in each case, every single day. So this is a data free-for-all, where there is no, I, no notion of control over what happens to the data. And that's a problem. Let's think of a little story about the NSA. In mid-2018, the National Security Agency of the United States published a piece of public guidance. The NSA says in this guidance, federal agencies, all government computers and devices, are facing a potential vulnerability 
because they are using conventional web browsers that allow a foreign spy outside America to reach into his or her pocket, pull out their credit card, and buy online ads targeted against employees of those agencies. And this hypothetical spy can decide what executable code is contained in that ad. Now what I've just said in a roundabout way is foreign agents, foreign actors, or domestic criminals can pay for the opportunity to run executable JavaScript type of software on US government machines. So we are still at a point where US government machines, and, and the same applies to every other government, of course, are vulnerable because they are still showing whatever ads the online ad system decides to show. And we all know who can buy those ads, anybody, and they can insert into those ads whatever code they wish. In 2018, a new regulation started to apply in the European Union. This is the GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation. Suddenly, European regulators in each member state country of the European Union have the power to impose fines, but much more importantly, much more importantly, they have the power to ban processing of data. Let me say that another way. European regulators now have the ability to force big tech to change how it does business with data. And that's a profound change. So that's the European Union. It's a very, very large market for digital services and digital media. But clearly, the United States is a, bi is a bigger market. In California, a few years ago, um, a wealthy individual called Alistair McTaggart came up with the idea of proposing a referendum for Californians to vote on over new rights that they would have in California about what happened to their data. Now, his initial um, project was subverted, really. I think that's fair to say, by the tracking industry. And the result, known as the CCPA, uh, is not as strong as I think Alistair would have wished. I, in fact, I know this. Um, so what Alistair has now done is he has submitted a second ballot initiative for a referendum. And this time, he is not going to allow it to be subverted. It will go through the process that he initially intended the CCPA to go through. And what that means is that individual Californians will have the opportunity to vote on this initiative without it going through a normal legislative process. It'll be a yes, no question on the ballot. And the most recent polling that I've seen from Alistair McTaggart is that only 4% of Californians will say no to this measure. Now what this means is that in the European Union, we have the GDPR, and in California, we're about to have CCPA 2. Now, if California has strong privacy protection, other states will follow, and you will end up with what industry does not want, which is a patchwork across the US of different requirements. That makes life hard for industry, and so they will be pushing in Washington for some unified single standard. And the political pressure will be for that unified federal standard to be no lower or weaker than the Californian one. We have to see what happens. Outside of Europe and the United States, we are seeing a whole series of what you might call GDPR clones. So there are many jurisdictions that literally take European regulation and duplicate. Uh, and duplicate. If you take all of the jurisdictions around the world that have some form of GDPR-like law, you end up with far more than 51% of the global um, uh, GDP. Now what that suggests is that the GDPR is emerging as a de facto global standard. It's also worth saying that one of these cases at Europe's highest court, right, the European Court of Justice, which is the equivalent in the European jurisdiction as the Supreme Court of the United States, that one of these cases has a very material bearing on all advertisers and all players in the advertising space. And that case, um, the ruling was handed down in the middle of 2018, and it's known as the Wirtschaft Academy case. So Wirtschaft Academy is the name of a business school in Schleswig-Holstein in Germany. This business school had been using 
Facebook fan pages to market its services. And what the local regulator said is, hey, business school, you cannot use Facebook to market your service because anyone who's interested in your services as a business school will be exposed to what Facebook is doing to their data to find out more about your business school. In a sense, you're complicit as the marketer by involving Facebook. Now, there was a cascade of litigation that went all the way through the German courts, and finally, it hit the European Court of Justice, as I said, the most uh, senior court. And what the European Court of Justice said is profound. First, it said, the marketer in this case, by deciding to use Facebook as the service to market what it's doing, has involved Facebook and has expressed targeting preferences. You know, we are trying to reach the following age people, the following disposable income, whatever it might be. Even though you as the marketer have never touched these people's personal data, you have actually partly determined the purposes and means, that's an important legal term, of the processing of their data, in this case by Facebook. So you are a joint controller. Second thing is, you as the marketer have asked for and received statistical reporting on the effectiveness of the advertising. And the European court said, you marketer are also therefore a joint controller. And in conclusion, what the European court says is, marketers who express target groups that will involve processing and receive back statistical reporting are joint controllers. Now that term joint controllers is a very significant one. If you are in the GDPR, if you are a joint controller, you are on the hook. You don't want to be. You didn't know you were. You didn't even think you asked for this stuff to happen. There may be a chain of companies involved, and maybe actually you're not a marketer. Maybe you're one of these companies, and some partner is processing data to make this campaign work the way it works. But actually, there's a very important article in the GDPR. It's Article 82, Paragraph 2. And what the article says is, in the event of damages that arise from an infringement of this regulation, all controllers are jointly liable. So, every brand in the world, every technology company that is working with every brand, everyone, every publisher, finds themselves exposed by what they are doing or by what their partners are doing. We're at a moment where Everyone is exposed to a risk that they do not understand and have not quantified. We still have, unfortunately, this cultural hangover from the last 15 years when there were no sanctions, no real sanctions applied to the law. That failure within the industry is going to result in a panicked need to make an urgent transition that should have been a gradual, mature, smooth one. And that's quite a terrifying prospect. It's not just governments bringing about change. There are a range of private companies, disruptors, that are also accelerating this change. I like to call it the privacy stack. So a whole range of um, solutions that anybody can use that give you the same services but respect your privacy and your data. We have DuckDuckGo, which provides an alternative for search. We have Proton Mail that provides an alternative for, for email. We have Minds, which provides an alternative for social media. And then there's Brave. Brave is a next generation web browser, one that puts user privacy at the core of their experience. So your personal information never leaves the device. The team at Brave have seen this industry from the inside. Brendan Eich, our founder, worked on Netscape in the 90s, developed JavaScript himself in 10 days, and also was the founder uh, of Mozilla Firefox. As a team, we know where the bodies are. And this is a chance for us to change the web. And it's not just about privacy. Cutting out the surveillance economy has a range of other benefits. Speed, your browsing experience can be way faster. Battery life, data costs. You're downloading a lot less and you're saving a lot more. So when we reflect on all of these changes that are taking place, from a, a regulatory point of view, new entrants providing viable alternatives, there is a chance that we can go back to some of that early enthusiasm across the web, that all of the people who are participating and collaborating, which is what makes the web special, they can all gain, they can all share in the value that's created, the knowledge that's shared, and the opportunity that flows from it.